Thank you for joining us. I'm Krista Dalton with the Department of Digital Government and ServiceNow, and I'm the moderator for today's question and answer session. Joining us today are the Honorable Sarah Studley, Minister of Digital Government and ServiceNow, RCMP Staff Sergeant David Osinger, RNC Constable James Cadigan, and Sean Dutton, Deputy Minister for Digital Government and ServiceNow. Please stand by. Our news conference will begin shortly. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Let me start by saying off-road vehicle accidents are not rare. They happen too often in our province, and I cannot stress enough that we need everyone to adopt more of a safety mindset when it comes to owning and operating off-road vehicles. Newfoundlanders and Labradorians need to understand the risks associated with the use of off-road vehicles and that it's everyone's responsibility to ensure that children, partners, friends, and family get to not only off enjoy off-road vehicles, but come home safely at the end of the day. As we prepare for second reading of the Off-Road Vehicles Act and regulations in the House of Assembly this afternoon, I'm delighted to be joined by Sean Dutton, the Deputy Minister of Digital Government and Service NL, Staff Sergeant David Ostinger, Head of the Newfoundland and Labrador Traffic Services for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and Constable James Cadigan, Media Relations Officer with the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary. We have all seen and heard media stories regarding off-road vehicle safety and the increasing number of accidents, injuries, and fatalities. According to the Newfoundland and Labrador Statistics Agency, since 2014, 68 Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have lost their lives in off-road vehicle accidents. Hearing such numbers undoubtedly brings back painful memories for mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, and friends. And sadly, we are still counting statistics. Since January of this year, there have been a further four fatalities in Newfoundland and Labrador from off-road vehicle accidents. We cannot and should not compromise safety. We recognize that for many people in rural and remote communities, Vehicles such as ATVs and snowmobiles are their primary means of transportation. I grew up in Grand Falls, Windsor. Uh, we had snowmobiles and ATVs. Uh, personally, I never loved snowmobiles. I could never get my feet warm enough. 
uh, but I love going for a ride on the quad at the cabin. Um, so I'm not an expert, but I am kind of comfortable and familiar uh, with using these machines. So uh, the changes we're proposing, we have combined the Motorized Snow Vehicles Act and the All-Terrain Vehicles Act into the new Off-Road Vehicles Act. My department's comprehensive review of this legislation inc included a jurisdictional scan of simul similar legislation throughout Canada. Leading up to the proposed legislative changes, the provincial government completed a comprehensive review of the legislation, including a jurisdictional scan of legislation throughout the country and extensive consultations with stakeholders, including the Newfoundland and Labrador Snowmobile Federation, Snowmobile Clubs, the Trailway Council, Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador, Canadian Off-Highway Vehicle Distributors Council, the medical community, Indigenous governments, Indigenous organizations, and enforcement partners. The modernization of the Act addresses their feedback and presents an opportunity for residents to renew their commitment to safe and responsible off-road vehicle use. We recognize the power of the Nunatsuvit government as well as the Inuit communities of Nain, Hopedale, Postville, Makovic, and Rigolet to make their own laws regarding operation and use of recreational vehicles. Additionally, under the Federal Indian Act, the regulation of off-road vehicle traffic on reserves is a bylaw making power of a band exercisable, exercisable by the band councils of Nashwashish, Sheshashi, and Con River. I would like to point out that the Act modernizes language to help users understand the requirements of the legislation and clearly recognizes side-by-sides as being subject to the law. So other areas uh, our proposed changes will touch. Uh, a person must not operate a dirt bike unless they are able to sit astride the bike with both feet touching the ground, and a person will not be able to operate a side-by-side -side unless they are able to sit with their seatbelt fastened and both feet on the floor. The Act also makes allowances for approved disability-related modifications based on manufacturer recommendations. In an effort to help reduce the number of brain injuries and fatalities, under the Off-Road Vehicles Act, it will be mandatory to wear helmets on off, all off-road vehicles unless exempted under the regulations. And so I think it's important to everyone to understand that in the Act we'll be debating today in the House of Assembly. Uh, we do not debate the specific regulations. Those will come afterwards. Uh, at the moment, we are considering regulations for factory sealed side-by-sides, as well as for hunting and trapping activities involving frequent stops if the speed of the vehicle is less than 20 kilometers an hour. I've also heard feedback from residents that they are concerned, um, sorry, uh, we are proposing in the regulations to enforce the use of seatbelts on any off-road vehicle equipped with them. I'm extremely pleased that the amendments to the Act will protect the province's youth by clarifying rules regarding age limitations. Proposed amendments will also require mandatory operator safety training for anyone under, the, under 16 years of age, anyone registering an off-road vehicle for the first time, and anyone convicted of an offense under the Act or regulations who has had their registration canceled or suspended. The training provisions will be brought into force once training is widely available. Those under 13 years of age will not be permitted to operate off-road vehicles with an engine size greater than 125 cc's. The Act also requires individuals under 16 years of age to be supervised by a licensed driver who is at least 18 years of age. When operating off-road vehicles near highways, operators will be permitted to cross a highway where the minimum visibility is not less than 150 meters in both directions. Crossing a highway on an off-road vehicle also requires a driver's license issued under the Highway Traffic Act. Operators are also permitted to travel along a highway to access a trail where the off-road vehicle is operated on the shoulder of the highway for a maximum distance of one kilometer and the vehicle is operated at a speed of not more than 20 kilometers an hour. When towing trailers, hitches, or attachments, these must meet specific safety requirements and operators are not permitted to tow passengers on or across a highway. Fines for violations of the Off-Road Vehicles Act and regulations will range from $100 to $2,500 for all vehicle types. We also have increased fines for second and subsequent offenses. The Government of Newfoundland and Labrador recognizes the value of outdoor activities, but safety has to be a bigger priority for off-road vehicle owners and operators in our province. 
It is the collective effort of those who enforce the legislation to ensure the law is upheld, and I commend the RCMP, the RNC, resource enforcement officers with the Department of Fisheries, Forestry, and Agri Agriculture, and other peace officers who enforce and educate the public on off-road vehicle safety. I now call on Staff Sergeant Ostinger and Constable Cadigan to share a few words. Thank you. Start up. Uh, you know, thank you, Minister Studley, for uh, the invite to come here today. And uh, I want to recognize my counterpart, with RCMP, Staff Sergeant Ostinger. You know, the RCMP and the RNC work together on initiatives related to traffic and uh, off-road vehicles uh, on a regular basis. And the RNC recognizes the value of uh, education paired with accountability as it relates to the operation of vehicles throughout our communities. And as Minister mentioned, the priority here is the safety and well-being of off-road operators and the passengers, and as a result, the community as a whole. The responsibility is placed on the user to be educated and equipped in order to achieve compliance. The proposed amendment, amendments not only address the safety and education of users, but will also equip our officers with the tools required to promote com compliance, such as attention to safety equipment, regulation of highway or road access, and certainly probably the biggest part of this uh, amendment, uh, the operator safety training. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, the RCMP of Newfoundland and Labrador are extremely pleased with today's announcement of the new legislation contained within the Provincial Off-Road Vehicles Act and its regulations. RCMP and L have responded to 47 fatalities involving off-road vehicles since 2018. There's a theme to these changes and the mandatory requirements around helmets, seat belts, safety training, and increased parental supervision are going to be of tremendous assistance to law enforcement and also to community efforts in decreasing the numbers of injuries and deaths involving off-road vehicles throughout our province. I would turn the floor to Mr. Studley or? Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, and happy to take questions after the meeting. Thank you very much. For the benefit of our speakers, we have three media in person and one joining by phone. There will be two rounds in the question and answer session, which will give each reporter the opportunity to ask one question and one follow-up per round. Our first question is from Glenn Wiffen with The Telegram. Please go ahead and make your way to the mic. All right, thank you for taking our questions today. Uh, I can't imagine what it's like coming up on a fatality uh, involving a quad or an ATV. It must be very difficult. Uh, just wondering how, uh, I'm talking to, I guess, the two police forces here today. Uh, how difficult is it, or how will these measures help you uh, uh, in your work involving ATVs and quads? Sure. Uh, well, if I may, uh, I'm really grateful for the proactive nature of these regulations. It's, it's going to put uh, better education and information in front of the public. Parents are going to be better empowered to make wise decisions in terms of allowing their children access to these machines. And they're going to be required to provide real, meaningful supervision. Uh, I anticipate that's going to save lives, first of all, and prevent the need for us to become involved in investigation of fatalities. James, any comments? <clears throat> and, and I'll echo that uh, sentiment. You know, uh, with regards to the operator safety training alone, uh, that factor, it, it allows education to be in the forefront as soon as a child or a young person uh, engages in operation of off-road vehicles. You know, the safety training is the first aspect of that, uh, that relationship. Uh, uh, in a follow-up, uh, Minister, is the training part of it figured out yet? Or how is this training going to uh, take place? Thank you for the question. So I guess just to reiterate, uh, the training that we're proposing right now is for anyone under 16 years of age, anyone registering an off-road vehicle for the first time, and anyone convicted of an offense under the Act of Regulations and has had their registration suspended or canceled. Um, so in terms of when we would proclaim different sections of the Act, uh, at the moment we still have to figure out all the training working with our safety partners. Um, and so that's something that would be proclaimed in the future and we don't have the specifics at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Bart Fraze with NTV. 
please go ahead and wake your, make your way to the microphone. Uh, one thing that I thought, the training is great, but the helmet use, uh, that's something that really resonates because we keep seeing it all the time. Uh, how important is their mandatory helmets as someone who comes up on an accident scene involving an ATV, either one of the officers? I would start that. I mean, you look at the factors available to protect persons who are operating these vehicles, and helmet to me is number one on the list. You know, it immediately protects your most valuable part of your head. And, uh, you know, uh, when you look at the mandatory aspect to this now, I mean, it's across the board. And our officers now have that knowledge that if you're operating an off-road vehicle, you are to wear a helmet. These vehicles are rarely ever equipped with doors or roll cages or airbags. Uh, they just don't have the engineered life space to keep a person safe in the event they uh, strike something. They come off the machine in most cases, and the human body just cannot withstand impact without some form of protection. And my second question is to do with enforcement. Uh, we've done several stories covering ATV enforcement and trying to be safe. It's always fun. They, they got a habit of running uh, and not stopping. What can you do? How can these regulations help with enforcement? Uh, myself and members of the RNC have actually collaborate, collaborated quite closely in developing operational plans for enforcement. Uh, in many cases, it involves a, a passive or covert surveillance so that we can gather the evidence we need to prosecute a person who's violating the law without having to confront them or even try to stop them. And we've found that's been a very successful approach in minimizing uh, the possibility of a pursuit or somebody fleeing. Thank you. Brian Callahan with VOCM. Please go ahead and make your way to the mic. I just noticed there one issue regarding um, the visibility necessary to cross a highway. We've seen a couple of recent fatalities on that very issue. It's specific to 150 meters, but is that realistic? How can you, you know, you're about to cross a highway. Where's your gauge for 150 meters? You know, like how do you narrow those down and enforce that? Uh, thank you for the question. I guess from my perspective, we would expect, you know, if someone's planning their route to have a, to consider that in advance. Um, and if you're not sure, then I would recommend you not cross the highway. Um, it, it, you know, we've, we have 150 meters for a reason and we're increasing it to that to that on recommendation uh, from our enforcement partners. Um, and so I think this goes back to the culture where we need everyone to take the culture a bit more, the safety culture a bit more seriously. And uh, when in doubt, don't cross the highway. Thank you. And just with regard to the legislation in general, I mean, obviously we see the effort here. We see the fatalities, the injuries every week and every day. Um, you know, do, do you expect people actually dig you know, dive deep into these regulations, into the legislation to follow every one of these? Or how can the average person, rurally or, or even urbanly, um, get a grasp on all of the different regulations and rules? Do we expect them to go through it? And, and the education component, again, seems to be the most important thing here, along with helmets. Um, how do you get people just to, to you know, sign on to this? Well, thank you for the question. That's excellent. Um, so I think the safety training will go a long way, as, as our enforcement partners have mentioned. Um, so just to reiterate, we're saying training will be required for anyone under 16 years of age, anyone registering an off-road vehicle for the first time, and anyone convicted of an offense under the Act of Regulations. So while, you know, next year that won't be a lot of people, over time we will move to see everyone um, or most people having done that, that operator training. Um, I guess the other thing is, you know, our press release today, there's an easy to reference table that I have in front of me as a cheat sheet. Uh, we've, we've purposely taken the two acts, combined them into one to make the rules as streamlined as possible and as simple um, and as palatable for most people to understand. Um, and so we're going to work with our safety partners and enforcement partners in terms of public education. I think that's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to now go to the telephone. Mark Quinn with CBC. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks for taking our questions. Um, Minister Studley, I wonder uh, just sort of broadly if you could explain uh, why you think it's necessary to repeal and replace the current legislation. Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, the current legislation we have, uh, there's a different ATV and Snowmobile Act. 
Um, and so what we're doing is com we're combining them to, ha where possible, have a streamlined set of regulations and, and legislation so that people don't have to search for these in different places. Uh, and we're also including side-by-sides because right now neither uh, piece of legislation explicitly includes side-by-sides. Um, and we wanted to do, uh, you know, we've been working on a fulsome review of the legislation. Um, and so it, it made sense as we we're looking to other provinces to combine it into one streamline a piece of legislation that we hope will be easy for the public to digest and follow. Thank you. And for the law enforcement uh, people who are involved here, um, I noticed that there's a change regarding um, uh, driving alongside the highway. And uh, if the proposed legislation would see uh, people being permitted to drive along the shoulder of the highway for as much as a kilometer, um, are you concerned that uh, this might be abused and people might uh, be using highways uh, more than they were in the past? Thanks, Mark. Uh, you know, we know from our experience in the community that ATVs require certain areas of, of uh, existing road to access trails. Uh, this goes back to the onus being on the operator, the owner of the vehicle, or the supervision to ensure that the safety precautions are being followed. They're clear here in black and white that uh, you must have 150 meters of sight line and you can travel for no greater than one kilometer and you can travel no quicker than 20 kilometers an hour. So knowing that information, it's important to plan ahead, look at the maps that you intend to travel and uh, ensure that your, your uh, path is in compliance with uh, these particular regulations. Thank you. Glenn Whiffen with the Telegram. Do you have a final question? Uh, I do. Uh, thank you. Uh, it seems like the new regulations, you know, uh, focus more to responsibility on parents uh, to take, you know, uh, to uh, educate their kids, I guess, on, on the use of these vehicles. Uh, was that the intent of the, uh, legis the new legislation? Thank you for the question. I think it's very important that pa owners and supervisors um, take their responsibility as, um, for these off-road vehicles very seriously. These are very powerful machines. Um, we've added in new provisions around supervision to make sure that, um, so for example, anyone under 13 um, has to be, has to operate um, a vehicle with an engine size no greater than 125 cc's, and anyone under 16 years of age must be supervised by a licensed driver uh, at least 18 years of age. Um, and then we've also uh, changed our fines and stuff to reflect the, the change that supervisors and owners really have to take their role very seriously um, and make sure that the people operating their vehicles are doing so within the, the legislation and regulation. Thank you. Barf Brace with NTV, do you have a final question? Uh, yes, I do, and it goes to training. I know you don't have all the answers yet because it's still a ways off, but have you given any thought to who will be offering this training or what form would be taken? Would it be, example, possibly doing it online for maybe? Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, we would absolutely uh, assume that the training would be available online. There could be some additional in-person training. Uh, and we've had some initial conversations with our safety partners. Um, and so we, we anticipate certainly having online training. There could be other options available. Uh, but we haven't worked out all the details yet. So thank you. Thank you. Brian Callahan with VOCM. Do you have a final question? Yes, just briefly. Um, we know we're in second reading, I believe, now with the legislation. When can public expect it to be passed? And does this all come the minute that's passed, the training, everything kicks in, just for the benefit of the public? Um, so we're going into second reading this afternoon. Uh, I hope we'll get a vote today, but uh, you never know. Um, and in terms of if when this receives a royal assent, we then have to bring um, work on the regulations. And we're anticipating right now potentially multiple proclamation dates, so different pieces might come into effect at different times. Um, for example, the training, where we don't have it figured out yet, we might um, bring proc proclaim, for example, um, the age limits and, and other things first, and then the training at a later date. Um, so there will be advance notice to the public. Thank you. We will now go to the phone. Mark Quinn with CBC. Do you have a final question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I, I remember during the last session of the House, uh, some of the uh, MHAs, the opposition MHAs, were, were questioning, uh, you know, when would this legislation come? Um, can you talk a bit about, um, Minister Studley, can you talk a bit about um, why it takes so much time to, uh, 
to repeal and uh, replace legislation like this. Thank you for the question. Uh, so this has been a, a top priority since I've been minister over the last year. Um, obviously, it's very complex. Uh, there's a lot of nuances, and we have a lot of partners. And I have to say, the team did extensive consultations uh, with lots of different groups. I named some of them already. Um, you know, the Trailway Council, the Snowmobile Federation, Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador, um, you know, d d dealer groups. Um, you know, we've heard from stakeholders. I've received a lot of letters and emails. Uh, we also have a lot of indigenous groups that we've, you know, did extensive consultations with, um, not to mention, you know, online surveys and working with the stats agency. Uh, and we really wanted, as we were doing a wholesome review of the legislation, we really wanted to make sure that while it might not be perfect and, you know, legislation is continuously improving, um, we wanted to make sure that we had a, a solid foundation um, and we didn't want to have any significant gaps. So uh, we're very, I'm very pleased with the legislation we're bringing forward today and will be debated in the House. Um, and as I mentioned, some of the details in terms of exclusions we might have for helmets uh, come f later in the regulations. Um, but we're very pleased, uh, I'm very pleased to bring forward this piece of legislation that I, I hope will significantly increase um, safety and being top of mind for people of the province uh, when they think about using their off-road vehicles. And if I, if I could just follow up, um, can you give us a sense of um, when the changes regarding helmets will come into effect? Um, so in terms of the changes relating to helmets, um, so once this, if this passes in the House of Assembly, uh, then our team has to go back and make, uh, make some tweaks to the regulations. We have a draft now, but we have to make some tweaks and then they have to be approved. Um, and so then we would issue kind of a press release and give some notice uh, to individuals. But I guess um, we're, we're planning on uh, making helmets uh, mandatory except for under certain exemptions. And so if, if people don't have helmets, I would encourage you to uh, start shopping around uh, for some helmets for your off-road vehicle use. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, please stay safe and have an enjoyable afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us.